Hi, I'm Cassidy from Centrifuge, and welcome to our series, DeFi Drip, where we talk about all things coffee and changing the world of finance. Um, today, we have Sebastian de Riveau, contributing member of MakerDAO's Strategic Finance Core Unit, and a longtime contributor to the Maker Core Protocol. Um, thank you for joining us today, Sebastian. Thank um, you very much, Cassidy. Yeah, yeah, it's really great to have you on. Um, of course, we want to start every episode uh, with, I think, the most important question. What is your relationship with coffee? Yeah, I'm quite addicted to coffee. I need it in the morning. Otherwise, otherwise, well, the day don't start, to be honest. Uh, so I drink uh, two big cup of coffee, almost one liter in the morning, and maybe a little bit in the afternoon, but I tend to switch to tea in the afternoon. <laughs> So it's a little bit later where you are now. So I guess you don't have any coffee on you today. No, no. Yeah, it's uh, quite late here. It's uh, 5 p.m. So it's a bit late for coffee. Okay, that makes sense. It's morning where I am in New York. So I've got my coffee here to fuel the call. Um, Enjoy. <laughs> yeah. So um, tell me, what, what do you do in your role with Maker? Yeah, sure. So I joined MakerDAO uh, two years ago, uh, just after the, the, the COVID uh, hit uh, the European landscape and the world, the world in general. Uh, and I quickly started to work on one small project. Uh, not a lot of people were working on it. It was kind of stuck. And the project was called, well, let's invest in a real world asset. And Centrifuge was in on this project uh, and others. And I was saying, well, I have a few weeks. Uh, let's try to do something in this project and see how it goes. Um, let's be honest, it took way more time than this. Uh, we are still at the beginning of the journey two years after. So quite a bigger project than anticipated. Uh, so, but in 2021, we make quite some good progress with the centrifuge and others going from zero to one. So we made the first investment. And then I switched in more to on the asset liability management side to see, well, how, how fast or, or how big can we go into the real asset uh, thing and how can we manage the balance sheet uh, in a safe and efficient way. Uh, so I changed a bit, but the, the idea is almost uh, the same. And uh, we created a Stackhouse Financial, which is a partnership that I created with other like many people from MakerDAO and others, and we are working for MakerDAO and Lido on finance and strategic issues. Uh, so as you know, just to, to give a, an overview, MakerDAO is decentralized. It's not a legal entity. So no one is really working for MakerDAO. So Stackhouse Financial is kind of a home for, for, for the team. And so what is it that you're trying to do with Steakhouse Financial and, and your work together with the Strategic Finance Core Unit as well? Yeah. So when I started to join uh, DeFi just before the DeFi summer, it was really tech-oriented. There wasn't a lot of uh, financial people in here. And so we tried to do pioneer work in uh, bringing a finance view into Web3. Uh, really thinking, well, not so much about the tech, not so much about gamification, not so much about shield farming and stuff like that, but really, well, if we want to create a new financial system from scratch, uh, how can we do it? And so that's why we, we made some, uh, I think, good work on real world assets in legal, in accounting. Uh, we made some good work in reporting because a lot of people are praising uh, our work in the financial reporting of Nikodau that are quite transparent. And so we always try to focus on finance for crypto. And uh, yeah, so I think we are quite serious about uh, getting things done and already it's a journey for us. Uh, we came to this new land that is crypto and we burned the chips, so there will no, be no way back to TradFi. So we really try to build something uh, from the ground up here. Yeah, cool. What is, um, I guess, the unique perspective that you think you're bringing to this then um, with Steakhouse Financial and your work with the uh, with Maker? Yeah, it's really bringing finance. So when I started uh, working at MakerDAO, and I always um, provide those uh, views, and I call it the balance sheet view. It's a term in accounting when you describe a company, a financial institution, by having assets and liabilities. And I use it since, yeah, since I joined uh, crypto and a lot of people are telling me, well, it's quite helpful to have this 
small infographics because then we can understand what's going on. And even if they don't have a full understanding of accounting, well, if you have asset and liabilities, well, you can kind of understand what is going on. And so we really try to bring this finance view or balance sheet view to the crypto ecosystem and to build something with a finance view and not only, well, let's do some Ponzi scheme or let's do some tech stuff for the sake of tech, really trying to bring uh, yeah, finance, the finance view into uh, Web3. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess, I mean, so diving into that, maybe TradFi side a little bit more, um, we're bringing in real world assets together into DeFi. So what role do you see them really playing within crypto, within the DeFi ecosystem? I think real world assets are key and they are a bit misunderstood currently. Because if you just look at crypto today, you have some crypto assets which are quite speculative. I mean, uh, you, can, you might love the Bitcoin, Ethereum and uh, the others, but well, you can buy, sell and hold. It's, you can make money or lose money and you can bring new people to the party, but it's just a big casino. And so it, it will not help the people and uh, the, the everyday citizens because, well, it's not creating anything. What we want, what we need is something to really create finance and finance being how can uh, people that want to save money lend to borrowers that will invest this money to consume now, create economic activity, or to invest, create corp uh, on corporates, um, startups, and so on. So it's really doing something useful at the end. And uh, if we don't have real world assets, uh, there is no point in doing DeFi because I don't eat uh, Bitcoin, I don't sleep in Ethereum. So I have a real house, I need uh, real goods. And if you cannot help this system, it's not, uh, it's not helpful. Yeah. So it's really about having an impact in the world that we actually live in today. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think you were one of the worst, the first con contributors to Maker. Um, you were one of the first contributors to Maker to help onboard centrifuge assets into the Maker protocol. Um, can you maybe share some highlights with us from that time? Yeah. Some things that you might have learned. Yeah. It was uh, quite a challenge and quite a long process. As I said, uh, we thought it would be uh, short, but um, we started to work with Centrifuge uh, from the MakerDAO perspective and see how we could onboard those great assets here to provide that are ERC-20 compliance. So it should be quite easy to add it to another smart contract that when you start and then you figure out that, wait a minute, it's way more complicated than that because it's permissioned, you need to perform KYC. Uh, there is a lot of legal implementations underneath. Even if the token is on the blockchain, you need to understand what is happening in the real world. Then you need to, so you have all those complexities, you need to explain it to, to the MakerDAO community, which is not uh, composed of legal experts and uh, high-level financiers. And they need to still to take uh, an informed decisions and find the best solution for, for their needs. Uh, so yeah, it was quite complex, uh, quite a lot of challenge. And the first one we got is, well, we are MakerDAO, we don't exist. How do, we, how do you sign a piece of paper? How do you sign the drop subscription agreement? And well, then you start and you find a lot of problems. And, but I think if I have to mention one thing that was more challenging than expected, it would really be working in, um, in the public, working transparently with uh, plenty of people, explaining to community uh, we are really working as a whole community, MakerDAO, Centrifuge and others, and really trying to figure out all, all, all together how we can move forward. And obviously sometimes when you put a lot of people in the process, it's, it's more complicated. But we achieved, yeah, sure. uh, we achieved the, the investment. Yeah, I think it was in May 21. Uh, and from then we made a other round of investments. So that's, that's a great outcome. What do you think has changed the most from that initial time? I think we are more uh, professional now in some ways. Uh, back in the day, it was really, well, we don't know anything. 
let's learn, let's work together to find out how we can find the initial solutions. Now we are more at the stage with that, well, the zero to one was done. And now how can we move from the one to one billion or one trillion of uh, yeah. real world assets? And uh, there was a lot of work being done with MakerDAO, between MakerDAO and Centrifuge on a new legal structure that is not already in, in the in production, I think, but it's really a good, uh, good work that was being done. And now I think Centrifuge is really leader in the legal structure and can scale without any limit, I would say. I mean, it's institution grade, so it should be able to, to go really fast. And if you just look at some numbers of uh, real world asset at Mikadao to just take a sense of the exp exponential that uh, exponential pass that we can have for real world asset. And of uh, 2021, there was uh, 15 million of real world asset at Mikadao, if we exclude uh, stable coins. Um, end of June, 2022, it was 40 million. Today it's 150 million and end of the year it will be half a billion. So that gives you the, next, the sense of the acceleration and the scales that we can achieve. So I think it's only the beginning. We are early, but it will move fast uh, in 2023. At least I hope so. Yeah, that's amazing to hear. So I think, I mean, what I'm taking as a summary from that, I think Maker has become a lot more professional in its approach overall. Um, and you have projects like Centrifuge bringing in institutional grade assets. Um, how do you see that Centrifuge Maker partnership growing from here? Yeah, so I think it's only a beginning. And uh, so we, we onboarded four asset originators, so four pools or four type of drop tokens. Uh, now, I think in the pipeline, we have uh, RFA, which is a Canadian bank. Uh, we have uh, an awesome deal with the Black Tower. So people that are more regulated, at least for the Canadian bank. Uh, so that's bring more scale, I would say, because if we are lending to a regulated bank, we can take, we take less risk so we can scale faster. And I think, uh, yeah, it's only the beginning and I would uh, really love to see uh, those centrifuge assets being more liquid in a secondary market, for instance. I know that we are still not there, but it will come at one day, one point that, well, all those real world assets will be quite liquid on DeFi and everyone will be able to trade those assets without friction. It's a nice vision. I think um, you have this blog called the Crypto Banking Network, where you share some pretty sophisticated thinking, like uh, like this thought that you just shared. Um, I'm curious if you can share with us a high level summary of how you think Maker and its potential role in the financial system looks beyond just DeFi. Yes. So as you said in my uh, blog, I study crypt what I call crypto banking and crypto banking is really how we can design a new financial system for Web3 and really taking the first principles of finance is about bridging borrowers to lenders. Some people want to borrow to consume or invest and some people want to lend because they don't want to consume uh, today. And if you look at TradFi, there is a lot of middlemen, a lot of friction, a lot of complexity. And so it's really, how can we use DeFi or the blockchain to build something new that is different and that is better? And let me give you an example on how uh, DeFi or the crypto banking system can change uh, how we use money every day or how we behave every day. Uh, if you look at TradFi, if I want to buy a cup of coffee, I will use my credit card or I will use cash, but usually not cash or Apple Pay. But it's coming from my bank account or any cash account where I have some cash and those cash will move from me to to you. More often, not the same day. It will take some time and a lot of complexities and a lot of middlemen will take one to two percent or even more. Uh, so what DeFi brings to the table is as, as we put a lot of liquidity, for instance, in uh, automated, automated market makers, there is a lot of liquidity. And now if I want to buy your cup of coffee with ETH and you want to receive USDC, it will be quite frictionless. 
uh, because you can use underneath. Obviously, we will have a nice uh, uh, Google or Apple app, and we will just underneath there will be a swap from ETH to USDC. So you will re you will receive USDC, and I will uh, spend some ETH. But the cost will be what five basis points. Currently, the cost to swap a, do a dollar stablecoin to a euro stablecoin is one basis point. So almost nothing. Try to do it in the real world, it will be at least 2%. Or at least that's what I pay when I use my credit card. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, mental shift that we can have using DeFi and uh, that will change the way we see things. Uh, try to use, I don't know, some Apple stock or Starbucks stocks to buy you a cup of coffee. It's not even possible. You cannot do it. In DeFi, you can quite do it uh, naturally. So yeah, so it's, but obviously we are super early. So we, I don't know where we are going to, but we are going towards this direction in a fast way. So the world will be quite different in five to 10 years. I'm really excited to see what that looks like. And I think, you know, for anyone listening, who's interested to read more about that, definitely check out Sebastian's blog, the crypto banking network. Um, I want to shift gears maybe a little bit to uh, a, a large topic on everyone's mind right now. Um, I think we all know Maker's come quite a long way, uh, gone through many changes since it first started. Um, how do you feel about the end game plan? And, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities that it can bring. Is there is there anything there that's really exciting you about that? Yeah, so the end game plan is quite complex and touch a lot of subjects. It's a big bundle of uh, plenty of ideas. I think one idea that is super important, at least for the short term, uh, because there is plenty of stuff that will be not implemented tomorrow, but that will take a few years. There are some stuff that will not be implemented for the next three years, only after three years. But the real idea that will change, I think, DeFi in 2023 is the simple idea to double down on the Hillwall asset, which is one part of the pigeon stance, if I'm pronouncing correctly. And uh, I think that's quite interesting because, well, we will just take the learning we made those last two years and move even faster. So as I say, we are already in an exponential phase and we will just move even faster. And uh, for instance, we, will, uh, we are currently working on the RFA deal, so the Canadian bank we discussed, on block covers, investing in short-term bonds, so plenty of uh, deals that uh, Maker will invest in or has at least signal its willingness to invest in. So I think people are not ready for the scale it will take in 2023. And obviously for us, it will be a lot of revenues that we might be able to distribute to die holders to compensate uh, the fact that they are holding die. So I think it might change uh, a little bit uh, DeFi as well. So I'm really excited about this one mainly. Nice. You mentioned a few of the real world asset deals that Maker has done recently, and they've been investing DAI in more traditional structures. Um, how important is it, do you think, for these deals to come on chain? Yes, we tried a lot of stuff uh, those last two years. And as you say, currently, we are a lot on the off chain world. But the end game is clearly to be on chain, because being on chain natively, brings a lot of uh, value. Uh, the first one being transparency. You can see uh, on-chain what is happening. Uh, the second one being uh, composability. You can have your assets, let's say a drop token of, uh, let's say, new silver. You can use it on Aave to borrow and plenty of stuff like that. You can swap it on Uniswap to get USDC, ETH or whatever. And that will unlock a lot of uh, solutions. And moreover, being on chain simplifies uh, the management of the real world asset because because you are you removing some of the intermediaries that you need in the real world. You need a lot of trustees and such such things. So going on chain, you remove and you use smart contracts when it's possible to to do. So I think it will uh, it will be uh, quite a challenge to go to to this end game. But we are definitely working towards this direction. I know that Centrifuge is working as well in this direction and is native only from the start. So I think it's, it will come soon and uh, the, 
the goal at least on my side is clearly to be uh, on chain. There is no purpose to to keep it off chain in let's say a few years. Yeah, I think we would agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, <laughs> I think, so one side of this puzzle is, um, the, the DeFi side, the makers, the centrifuges of the world, but the other start is the other part is the institutional side. Um, so I'm curious how soon you think institutions will really start using DeFi for real world assets. Yeah, the, the subject of institutions and DeFi is always uh, a strange one because every institution is looking towards De to DeFi. They want to use it, but it takes a lot of time. Uh, one, because they are uh, usually regulated institutions, so big institutions and everything takes a lot of time. They need a lot of approval. Uh, there is some uh, regulatory uncertainties, I would say, uh, especially in the US, so everyone is a bit stressed to, to know, are we allowed to do it? Are we not allowed? Should we perform KYC? How do we do it? And, and so on. So it's a lot of uh, small challenges and uh, maybe at some point regulation will be uh, easier to work with, but uh, we will see. So I think they, are, they will come, but as always, it takes a little bit of time. Uh, and so maybe next year, the year after, we will see. I mean, uh, Let's remember that, uh, was it last year then uh, El Salvador used Bitcoin at the legal tender? So it's mo it's moving in the good direction. So I'm not worried. It will take more time than we expect or that we want, but it will move. Yeah. So it's only a matter of time before institutions inevitably just start using DeFi. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, clearly. And if you look at just... Uh, it, was it Blackstone? No, it was KKR that uh, issued some uh, token for one of their funds on Avalanche. So they are trying and test the, the landscape. It will come. Um, do you think in within this new landscape that we're heading towards, um, that Maker is really positioned to excel for, for something unique? Is there a reason that you think Maker is really going to be the one that succeeds there. Yeah, I think Maker is in the good position going forward because it we have a six billion dollar balance sheet, which is not something you find uh, across the street. Uh, we have a, a good position. We are the, the biggest uh, decentralized stablecoin in the DeFi space. So that's that's a good starting position. Obviously, it doesn't mean we will thrive because we need to provide value for our customers, but we have a good starting position and I think we will make the, the best of it. Yeah, cool. I think uh, maybe to, to add some spiciness to our conversation, I'd love to hear if you have a, a hot take for us, uh, maybe something around TradFi or DeFi, real-world assets, um, or anything else on your mind, really. Yeah, sure. So I have two topics that I dear to, to my heart is one, uh, real world asset, but I think we spend, uh, the last half hours uh, speaking about it. I think also the having a yield curve in DeFi is uh, quite a game changer. Uh, that's something I was hoping for last year that didn't happen. I was hoping for this year. It didn't happen to be honest, just like real world asset. Uh, but I think for next year, we might go a big shift toward the uh, term loans. And I think uh, even with, the, which is linked somewhat to real world assets because all the real world assets underneath, you usually have uh, loans that are for, uh, for a certain maturity. So having the ability to not just do some small time lending, which like you have the RV and the component of the world where, well, you are lending and the rates change every block which is always a bit uh, difficult to understand if you want to make a, a real one investment, for instance, but you will be able to borrow to one month, three months, one year, two years, maybe 30 years and buy a house with a fixed interest rate. So there will be a lot of uh, derivatives on those products, some uh, credit uh, derivatives, some uh, uh, interest rate swaps, 
a lot of stuff that will, for one, make a lot of activity on the blockchain, which is always good uh, for Ethereum because the more the activity, the more the gas fees, so the more we are burning ETH, and the more um, more uh, pricey is uh, Ethereum. So that's always good, uh, at least if you are holding ETH, not if you are using it. Uh, so yeah, the yield curve and real asset are the, my two bets for the next year. Cool. We will see what happens. Yes, I, I mean, <laughs> do you think that um, having that yield curve as one of your bets is a is a hot take? Do you think people disagree with you? I think people are not taking it as important as it will be because when you have the yield curve uh, you have a lot of uh, arbitrage opportunities and that might bring uh, institutions uh, way faster than we might expect uh, which is why maybe i wasn't so sure for next year for the institutions but maybe maybe they will come uh, next year and i mean we already have a lot of uh, institutions because uh, we have a small some banks that we are lending to uh, notably société générale in france we have a block tower, we have a plenty of quiet institutions, but they are not here playing because there is not the infrastructure yet to have a lot of activity on, on the blockchain. So, yeah, I think the, the yield curve is, people will not disagree, but it's not on the radar of most people. And I think it will change everything. Interesting. I guess, I mean, we keep dancing around your your thoughts around the timeline there, timeline for real world assets, for institutions to really come into DeFi. Um, if you were to make a bet, when would you say real world assets will truly be on chain? That's an interesting take because one side is to have the infrastructure, the capital providers, the big players, the institutions. So that I would say might be next year or the year after. And one other is to have uh, retail, and for that, the next billion user of DeFi, which might be even more interesting, but that, for that, you need a, a good UI, you need to have the good layer tools, uh, so that will come as well, but there is still a lot of work in the UI. I mean, uh, I live in DeFi, and I know it's complicated to, to use uh, a lot of tools, so I cannot expect uh, retail to come uh, soon enough. So there will be a lot of uh, work in this area. So I would say institutions playing, let's say, 1 billion or 10 billion of real asset next year. And uh, the, the retail will come a few years later. What and do you I think is the, the main um, blocker for institutions coming into it? I mean, you mentioned that it's difficult for them to use. Is there a specific reason why when it comes to things like UX, or are you thinking of something else there? No, for institutions, I don't think the main blocker is uh, UX. It's really about regulation. I mean, I spend a lot of time working on KYC AML, uh, which is not something that is uh, super funny. But when you speak with institution, just to give you uh, an example, there was uh, one uh, big institution asking for the KYC process, uh, would they be able to perform KYC on all the MakerDAO employees or contributors? And I was like, yes, so let me explain to you that some people, we don't, we don't know how many there are, to be honest. Some are anonymous. I can t tell you that we have this guy long for wisdom working for us. I don't know who he is. Maybe Niv is in the UK, but not even sure. Maybe it's a bot. Who knows, really? So what will you do with it? And so there's a lot of talks about, well, if we cannot do this, maybe we can do that instead. And yeah, it's, it's quite a risk. But it's just like if you look when we started the, the conversation two years ago, uh, onboarding the first real world asset of uh, Centrifuge on, into uh, Mikada. It was mainly small entrepreneurs that were willing to take a lot of risk, uh, willing to challenge the status quo and doing the hard work, really. If you look last year and or more precisely this year, now we have uh, regulated banks, we have Société Générale, uh, we have uh, RFA, 
So we have the biggest, bigger institutions coming in. And when those will be public and will use MakerDAO for funding, the next step is quite obvious. We will have, uh, we will work with, uh, I don't know, the PIMCO of the world, the BlackRock, and actually we are already investing in uh, BlackRock ETFs. So those people will say, wait a minute, there is a big business opportunity. Our competitors are using this uh, business opportunity. What are we waiting for? And they will come because there is no other alternative. They want to survive and they want to thrive like everyone else. So at least I'm a big believer that DeFi is a solution to some problems. So they will see the light as well, I guess. And I for sure will sure <laughs> and for sure I will work in uh, in making them understand the value proposition of uh, DeFi for them. Yeah, I'm definitely a believer as well. And I, I hope that we can continue working on that together for sure. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you, Sebastian, for, for joining us today on this series, DeFi Drip. Um, it was a pleasure to have you on and have this conversation with you to dive into Maker and your your new team, Steakhouse Financial, as well. Um, and really great to hear your point of view. Thanks. It was a pleasure to, to have this uh, discussion with you and it was uh, quite a lot of fun.